when you look at the houses on Center Street in Bay City, you are looking at a piece of Michigan's history. These homes were built by the wealthy lumber barons who owned the prosperous lumber mills around the Bay City area during the 19th century. Michigan's lumber boom was like that of California's gold rush. Because of this, Michigan was able to develop both financially and industrially at the beginning of the 20th century. Before the lumber boom, Michigan was a great wilderness filled with dense forests inhabited by its natives. It wasn't until the Europeans arrived that the lumber was being harvested to build forts and fur trading posts. The uh, logging actually started on the, in the Saginaw Valley in the 1860s, uh, but peaked in the 1880s. Uh, most of the sawmills were located in Bay City. The, of course, the early ones were in Saginaw. In the 1830s, the first sawmills were developed in the Saginaw Valley area. This led to lumber being produced commercially to meet the demands of businesses such as the shipping industry. Saginaw was the perfect place to begin for the lumber industry, with its 3 million acres of white pine and over 1,500 navigable rivers and streams. Among those rivers was the Saginaw River, which had a length of 864 miles. The interesting thing is that even though Saginaw was the first city, the river in Saginaw was not exceedingly deep, only in Bay City. So it didn't take long for the uh, lumbermen realizing the only way they're gonna get their lumber out was by, by the river, by uh, vessels. The quality of, of the pine in Bay City in the Saginaw Valley was exceptional. It was a slow growth pine, uh, not free, and uh, it was sought after by the Eastern markets for furniture making. Uh, Henry W. Sage, which had one of the largest sawmills in the world, uh, located in Vets Park in Bay City. When he built his house out east, it was said that the, the uh, contract called for only clear Saginaw Valley white pine to build that house. And it is said that there was not one knot in any of the wood used in that house. I'd say 90% plus of all the logs that were cut at the mills of the Saginaw River, especially Bay City, went to eastern ports like uh, 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 Cleveland, uh, De uh, Detroit, uh, uh, Buffalo and Tonawanda. Uh, Buffalo and Tonawanda actually received 90% of everything that was uh, produced in the Saginaw Valley. Uh, now to, get, to get back to the, to the Saginaw River, uh, the, a lot of the lumber that was produced here, like I said, went east. But one of the interesting facts is that the amount of square timber, the thousands of cubic feet of square timber that was shipped out of the Saginaw River went over to Europe because of course Europe didn't have any force left per se uh, because of the centuries of logging it off. So uh, uh, it was very important that uh, these uh, lumbermen found that the, the market for Europe was even very profitable for them. The, uh, the wood would be put onto uh, special made schooners taken to uh, 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 Ontario and put on schooners and then shipped overseas. The working condition for lumbermen out in the, the woods was uh, by far, you know, uh, kind of rough for them. Uh, they worked in cold weather uh, and of course everything was done by hand. There was, there was no automation of anything. And accidents were of course very common in the woods. Uh, they would have the, the problem of when they would cut a tree if it wasn't cut just right, it would kick back. And these guys are standing right there. Or the tree would fall and hit the branches of another tree, and they would those limbs would end up flying off like shrapnel. Now, of course, this logging was all done in the wintertime. That was the most economical way to get them to the rivers. The logs were, were sawed and put on, on uh, log sleighs. And you see pictures of log sleighs that are piled, you know, like 15, 20 feet high with only two horses 
with the sled. Uh, that was just for show, that never actually happened. Most of the sleds would have maybe five feet of logs, six feet of logs piled up on them because uh, the weight, the horse just, just couldn't pull that much weight. The, once the logs were, were taken to what they call a, uh, a booming ground, uh, that's where they would stack them up, where there'd be millions and millions of feet of logs piled up and waiting for the spring rain to come in and to thaw. And then they would always dump them into the river. Uh, probably a good example uh, would be the Lumberman's Monument, uh, the rollaways up there. We had sort of rollaways here in the Saginaw Valley, but most of them were along the Titaboa Sea River. Uh, it is said that uh, during the heyday of the logging industry, you could walk from Midland to Saginaw on the Titabawasi River and not get your feet wet. Uh, the, log, the river was completely choked with logs. Uh, these logs were eventually then uh, sorted out at, at what they call sorting grounds and put into uh, log booms, and then these tugs would take them to the different sawmills. The 1850s saw the invention of the circular saw, which was put to good use in the lumber mills. Now the sawmill operations were extremely interesting. Uh, the one thing was that they would have to go up an incline and then go through a rotary saw uh, and, and actually cut them into different uh, thicknesses of, of wood. Some of the logs, they said that the saw, uh, the, the saw blades would go as high as uh, six foot in diameter because some of these logs were so thick, the average three-foot blade could not cut through the logs. Two other inventions made it so that logging wasn't a winter-exclusive affair. The big wheels, which was an alternative to sleds, and the narrow-gauge railroads, which opened up new areas for logging. Uh, these were very efficient, but they did not last long. Uh, they, because once the area was logged off, which would take a couple months, they would either have to build further into the woods or if there wasn't profitable, they just left everything there and went to someplace else and started to, uh, uh, to take the forest out. Unfortunately, the European method of clear cutting began to take its toll. By the boom's end, Michigan was stripped of 19.5 million acres of its forests. Uh, up to that time, by the, by the uh, uh, 1890s, most of the logs in this area were com woods were completely gone. There was there was nothing but hardwood left, uh, which was better, which was beneficial to the shipbuilding industries. And fortunately, the government by that time uh, realized what had happened in Michigan and decided to put a hold on how much lumber could be cut. The lumber barons tried to sell this worthless land by setting up demonstration farms, tricking unsuspecting farmers into buying small plots of land. The farmers realized they were cheated when they realized that the land was ill-suited for growing crops. But by then, the lumber barons had completely abandoned the land, and it was returned to state ownership. During the Great Depression of the 1930s, the Civilian Conservation Corps planted millions of seedlings all over Michigan to regrow its forests. However, areas known as stump prairies still exist, even though it has been a century since they were stripped of trees. Today, over half of Michigan's landmass is covered in forests. Logging continues to this day, especially in the northern area, but is now being done selectively with the process of tree farming. The lumber industry will also remain an important part of Michigan's history. The, the logging industry here was, was fantastic. In uh, 18, 1882, uh, for the month of May, there was 67,833,000 feet of lumber shipped out of the Saginaw River. And it wasn't uncommon to have uh, the uh, uh, a, a line of boats waiting to get out of the river. It brought about the growth of the state, as well as the destruction of many of its forests. The lumber boom will also marry Michigan's very own gold rush.